Everything Entrepreneurs! Welcome, welcome each and every one of you. We are so excited to have you with us. Uh, you are the chosen ones, so give yourselves a hand. So my name is Kitty Barker. I'm with the Virginia Tourism Corporation. And the key word there is tourism, and I will uh, certainly be available for tourism businesses to help you with uh, questions on that. And I am part of the My Southwest Virginia Opportunity Team. That's a group of partners uh, that work together to create these entrepreneurship challenges and classes and workshops and education for businesses. And I'm so excited that you are in the Advanced Cup. You are the first. Yay! Do your whistle for me, Sandy. Thank you. <laughs> so, just to give you a little information about the Opportunity Steering Team uh, and our purpose, uh, we were able to raise $35,000 for business investment grants uh, to existing businesses that are looking to expand and that could be expand with additional job creation, um, expanding your, your footprint, expanding your inventory, uh, however you, you look to expand. Our goal is to support the, the regional uh, criteria, which is arts and culture, outdoor recreation, value added agriculture or agritourism, locally owned and operated restaurants and food services. We will not be giving McDonald's money. Okay. Yay. 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 <laughs> or Holiday Inn or something like that. Best. Just small businesses. We love locally owned and operated hospitality lodging. Uh, we are open to technical and advanced manufacturing and retailer support services. <clears throat> so we want to um, Make sure each of you understand this is a six-week business class every week, and you cannot miss. If you miss, you are not eligible to win one of the awards. Speaking of awards, <coughs> first place is, do you know? Drum roll. Win the drum roll. $20,000. Yes, $20,000. Second place is $10,000. And third place is 5000 Is that pretty good to help you get started? Yes. 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 Yay, team. Um, so each of you uh, were selected because you were in one of our past entrepreneur challenges. And we had just some basic challenges going on throughout uh, Lena Wisco, Common Plateau, and the Mount Rogers PDCs. So each of you have gone through that first initial business planning 101. You did pitches, you did your business plan, and you're up and running. So how's it going? Are you having fun yet? Yeah? Yep. Yeah? yeah, I just congratulate you all for, because um, some of them I started with these two and Sandra right here, and um, just doing great. And so proud of all of your accomplishments. Um, so we also want to, um, go over the schedule. <clears throat> today is September 15th, so today you're getting your introduction and some examples of successful business models. Uh, now, these topics are going to be harder and more in depth, and we're going to dig deeper than what we did in that first set of challenges. First set of challenges, we're just doing kind of like a 101, getting started. This is going to be much more advanced, so you'll be able to walk away with some strong information under your belts to help your business. But you know, we're all still here, uh, and I'll be introducing our partners. We're all here in the region, and if you get stuck, don't sit there for three months <laughs> being stuck. What should you do? Yeah, all of us are connected electronically. Call us. We'll come see you. We'll go have lunch. It's just an excuse for us to eat. And you know, we will come and visit with you and work through your, your, your problems. And Robin is our key person here. And if you get stuck, just call her and 
she will send you to finance person or marketing person or HR person, whichever resource we have to help you out with that. Don't want you getting stuck. That's what happens to lots of entrepreneurs. They get stuck and then they just start falling apart. So as soon as you start sensing that, uh, call Robin or call one of us. All right, on the week two is September 22nd. All your meetings will be here at the same time. We're going to have marketing and research, and this is much more in depth than what we talked about before. On the third week, managing your growth, we're going to talk about employee relations. Because as you get bigger, you need to hire somebody. And that means you've got to let go. And you've got to hire somebody. And how do you hire somebody? And how do you work somebody? And how do you have all those HR policies in place? What about insurance? Income tax, all that stuff. So we'll talk about that. Week four is managing your growth, and that's deeper into financial and legal. As you grow, your legal responsibilities and accountabilities are going to increase. You're going to have to figure out that you're doing things legally, and your finances are going to get more complicated, especially when you hire somebody on. Okay, uh, on the 13th, we're going to talk about leadership training, and on the 20th is when we do uh, the pitch night and your business plan submission on October 20th. This is a lot quicker than some of you are used to. Our first entrepreneur challenge is like 12 weeks. This is six weeks. It's going to be more packed in. And so every week when you go home, <coughs> what should you do for your homework? Work on your pitch and your plan. Yes. <laughs> Work on your business plan. Don't wait. How many of y'all always waited until the night before the term paper was due to write the term paper? <laughs> Jennifer's like, no, I did it. Yeah, you can't do that with this. <laughs> You're busy. You need to work on it every week. Have your draft. Bring the draft in. Let people look at it. Polish it. So you've got to work on your business plan and practicing your pitch. Have y'all seen Shark Tank? You know they're doing their pitch in about 30 seconds. It's a little pitch. So if you don't know how to do a pitch, go on YouTube. The top pitches are on YouTube. And you can see. And you've got to stand up in front of the mirror and practice. Practice with your dog, your cat, your bird, your child, your neighbors. Practice. Because uh, when you get up here and start looking at everybody, all of a sudden everything's going to go right out of your head and you're not going to remember what you're supposed to do. So practice so you got it under your belt. Uh, and then our award ceremonies will be in sometime early November. Okay, did I cover everything on that? Yep. Okay. Uh, I want to recognize our sponsors because we, we have an action team that actually really worked hard on this. We were on conference calls once or twice a week, getting the criteria. And, um, you know, when we first put it out, we were afraid nobody was going to sign up. Y'all kind of fooled us. <laughs> so we're very happy that you signed up and that you uh, have agreed to be in this. Of course, dangling $20,000 and $10,000 and $5,000 out in front of you is a pretty good incentive. So uh, we were able to have several sponsors, and we want to thank those people. Um, Department of Housing and Community Development, Appalachian Regional Commission, Virginia Community Capital, and Southwest Virginia Technical Council. Uh, UVA Wise and the County of Bland put money in. So we're very happy uh, to have those folks help with our cup, our advanced cup, and um, we can't do all of this without uh, sponsors and helpers. So I want to introduce to you, uh, recognize the steering team. I'm going to start back here with uh, Sandy and let her uh, tell you who, who she is. <clears throat> I'm Sandy Ratliff. I'm with the Department of Small Business and Supplier Diversity. I have an office uh, down the hall, but it's really in a Chevrolet uh, somewhere on 81. I serve 23 counties. It's about 32 communities. Um, helping folks not only get started, but also helping to tap into resources in Virginia, um, as well as doing a lot of training to help from marketing to using technology in your business to how do you sell to the Commonwealth of Virginia, which is a $6 billion market. 
So if there's everything I can do for you, I'm just a phone call or a click away. And we are honored to have our new SBA representative, Carl, who's driving down from Richmond every week to be with us. So introduce yourself, Carl. Carl Knobloch, Small Business Administration. Uh, I got the whole state. And uh, it's great to be here in the Southwest, helping in any way. And you can text me, and I will come here. You can know it matter early in the morning. I've already met people at 7 o'clock in the morning. I've driven down, got up at 1 o'clock to be here. So it's not a problem. I'll meet you in the evening if that's what's needed. So anything I can do to help you, that's all that matters. And Kathy's on our team. And I'm Kathy Lowe. I'm the director of the, the incubator that you are uh, sitting in tonight. And uh, we help small business with a variety of needs. Um, we work in conjunction with Sandy. We help pre pre present. Um, free business knowledge classes that we actually put on YouTube. So, whatever you need, we're here for it. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Uh, Tim? Uh, good afternoon. I'm Tim Blankenbeckler with Mountain Empire Community Colleges, a small business development center. So, we serve Lee, Wise, Scott, the city of North Minnesota portion of Dickinson County. We're not sure where that line is. <laughs> Southwest Virginia also has a SBDC program that covers the other areas. So SBDCs are located here in Abington, Whitfield, and just wherever you're fiscally located, I would encourage you to get up with that resource. I'm glad that Carl's here tonight because the SBA funds our program. Now I know who to call for the 6 o'clock morning <laughs> meetings. <laughs> the late afternoon meetings. So, but we do try to come to your location if that's best, or you can come to us, whichever makes the most sense. So it's good to see everybody again, and have a great time. All right. Ernie, very briefly, because he's going to talk to you here in a minute. Go ahead. Ernie Maddie, the business launch coordinator for the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development. We provide the grants for the, the different communities around the state to do the business plan challenge. Yay. That was so sweet. Uh, so now I'm going to make you talk, and I'm sure you've all practiced. But I want you to introduce yourselves, and in one minute, tell me your business idea. Do a little pitch in one minute. Now we will give you the your minutes up signal if you get too verbose. So just quickly, who you are, what your business name is, and what is your business? Can you do that? Sure. All right. You want to start right here? <laughs> Stand up. Get used to this. My name is Catherine Hayden. I own Sweetworks. I make custom cakes and cupcakes. Um, my kitchen that I'm here tonight to expand my business. <laughs> He's going to kind of take up on the catering part, but um, my part is the cakes and cupcakes, and I do custom designs, and then um, he will be accompanying me with the catering. Okay. Let's give her a big hand. <laughs> now, I just want to remind all of you that are cooking things, if you need some taste testers, <laughs> if it's chocolate, I'm in. <laughs> goat creams and lotions to tell, let us try them and tell them what flavors we like the best. So do not be shy about bringing in samples because y'all will help, help, right? We actually do a little survey. Is it too sweet, too dry? Where's the guy with the horse barn? Uh, manure? Yes, <laughs> manure. Okay. Hi, I'm Tony Warren. Um, nothing quite as tasty. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
if you had a fire or a flood or damage from storms, we come in, we clean it up, we put everything back together, start to finish, um, you get you and I, and that's a big part of our business model. All right, thank you. This is my friend Karen, and I am proprietor of Liaison America. Liaison America is a company that develops international programs for universities and also for educational institutions. We've been in the market for two years. We expanded our company for another state, so now here in Bluefield, Virginia, we host students from all over Brazil and also we take university representatives down to Brazil to develop partnerships. If you'd like to have a partnership in Brazil, you have to talk to me first. <laughs> I'll give you good guidance and I'll make your partnership to grow. So I hope that being here with you guys, it's not just an opportunity to gain a prize, but to get to know each of you and maybe we can make business together. That's my hope. Thank oh, you. Great. Thank you. I just want to remind you that I did volunteer to go to Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> you just named the day. Oh, how about the Baileys? I'm just a uh, first show. Stand up. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Bailey, and this is my husband, Greg. We currently own Bailey Hardware in St. Paul Suites and Cottages, and we are preparing to open up uh, Sugar Hill Brewing Company, which will be a full-service restaurant and a brewery. So we are working in the town of St. Paul, and St. Paul is trying to um, capitalize on our tourism in the area that started when the ATV trails came in. So Bailey Hardware began selling the permits that people need to go up on the trail. We started the overnight um, rentals because we saw that there were no hotels in the area, so we were the first in town to, to convert our uh, monthly rentals over to nightly rentals. And since then, we've had two others go into town. Well, now we've decided that St. Paul needs something else to draw even more people in, so we're going with the restaurant and the brewery, and we know nothing about it, <laughs> but we're, going, we're learning as we go, and if you all would like Beer samples, we'll try to arrange them. And ATV. <laughs> and ATV right. Oh, that was one thing, too, I didn't mention about the ATV excursions. We started that, where we're the first that we know of, because it was a hard time finding insurance, to be able to, we bought a large ATV, and we can now take people out on the trail. You don't have to rent them and drive yourself. We can take you, have a picnic, go to the overlook, the pond. It's great. And Greg's my chauffeur. Uh, yes. <laughs> My name is Marla, and I used to drink beer and ride four wheelers. <laughs> but I was never paid for it. <laughs> I have the Crooked Road General Store on the renowned Highway 58, which is a 300 mile stretch of bluegrass, country, and gospel music. And I'm honored every Monday night to host the Mountain Empire. Uh, no, that's you. You're hosting Mount Empire. Uh, Mountain uh, Music Show. And what we do is we have different performers from all over the country come in. And some of those uh, performers, I'm honored to have high school students from right here in the area come in and get to share the stage with also more renowned people like Rhonda Vincent in the Rage or uh, Bluegrass female champion Dale Ann Bradley. Um, we serve a good supper and uh, brown beans and fried bologna and bluegrass. And my goal is to take a festival up on the hill on, on the farm behind the mm -hmm. store there. And uh, Pat, her nickname is Dustpan, and uh, <laughs> I brought her along with me for support tonight. So thank you so much for having thank me. Thank you. My name is Dave McLeish. I own Dreamland Alpacas in Meadowview, Virginia with my wife, Debbie. Um, we currently have 62 alpacas on our farm and do a lot of farm tours. We're looking to expand our business because we get a lot of tours and school groups so we're looking to add an area where we can teach kids and other people how to how to convert the fiber into finished products so that's what we're looking to expand into All right. Hi, my name is Nicole Dyer and I own White Birch Juice Company here in Abingdon. We're a 
a juice and smoothie bar. We're the first and only in the region making fresh uh, cold-pressed juice and fresh fruit and vegetable smoothies. So our aim is to provide fruits and vegetables in a convenient <coughs> way, grab and go bottles and cups, uh, make it more convenient for all of us in our busy lifestyles to get more healthy foods into our bodies. Um, we also have wheatgrass and ginger shots and are looking to expand our production and hopefully be able to expand where we can provide juice to. All right, excellent. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tommy Kondo from River Monster Guide Service. We currently uh, provide guided fishing tours on the New River, North Fork of the Holston, and the Clinch River. And we're looking to expand to a location in Whitfield. We're going to provide uh, canoe, kayak, paddleboard rentals, bike rentals, and mountain bike rentals um, in 2016. Awesome. Welcome. Hey, y'all. How you doing? I'm a recent veteran. My wife and I opened up a coffee shop in Marion, Virginia called Kobe Cafe. We're looking to expand to a different venue, something that's going to provide us uh, a full-size kitchen and something to give us drive-through service. I think is something that we need to do to, uh, to expand. We're also moving into the Wayne Henderson building as a Kobe kiosk to provide really? snacks and uh, coffee and stuff like that for the students as well. Fantastic. Another Marion fella? Yes. Um, I'm Mike's uh, shoulder when we come down here. <laughs> my name is Mike Edwards. I work for my wife who owns the Collins House Bed and Breakfast in Marion. I have to put it that way so every guy knows their place. <laughs> our purpose in being here tonight is to expand our business in the non-room revenue areas of our inn. And that's to make this a travel destination for people that come to Southwest Virginia where nobody goes after Roanoke because they don't know we exist here. And our purpose is to make people know we exist by catering to the new group of trout fishermen coming into this area, fisher people I should say, through educational programs, through the guided trips, which we will be doing as well. Also for the motorcyclists who come to Southwest Virginia. Fantastic motorcycle routes that leave Marion and go through the whole countryside out there, we're bringing those people here. By bringing in people, we also will be working with non-paid uh, internships for people who want to know the small business entrepreneur type program in the lodging industry is what we do. And we invite all of you, if you have any need for bed and breakfast, come to Marion. We're number one in Marion. We're number one in Southwest Virginia. Mm -hmm. Very good. Hi there, I'm Jill, and I'm also in Marion, um, located downtown on Main Street, and I own Wolf's Barbecue, and my husband will be here because he's at the restaurant, so maybe he'll get to meet him later um, throughout the weeks. And we own a full-service restaurant. We're open six days a week, and we specialize, of course, in barbecue. Um, we do brisket, ribs, pork, chicken, we smoke wings. Um, we also have other items on our menu as well. Um, we've been open for two years and we've been very blessed. And we're looking to expand in a food truck or a food trailer to take our products and spread it throughout Southwest Virginia and to bring more people to downtown Marion to our full service restaurant. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Right, welcome. Again. Samples are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's delicious. You got delicious. I know. I'm Nathan Long, Quick Hanger Ranch Adventure Outpost. Uh, planning on being a uh, multifaceted destination now in uh, Flatwoods out in Coburn. Uh, we've got a bunch of uh, trails uh, for horseback riding and a lot of camping opportunities. Uh, <coughs> hope to work with some of our partners uh, and other businesses to try to uh, sublet some of the river trips and different things. So. We're going to be out there, uh, we're about a mile or so from Kiss River Gorge and Falls and all those places. So, we're going to work on the Fred Trails and as the Scott County Horse Park, uh, one end of the trailhead. And I'm hopefully going to be the other with the gateway to the High Knob Lake, right, or uh, what do you call it, Bar Camp Lake, uh, and all that to, uh, to be able to have unique lodging in our location on the TVs and 
cabins, as well as some cowboy tents and different things, and hopefully in all west town eventually to uh, just have a whole western, go back to the yesteryear kind of environment. So uh, to be able to really uh, keep people around and you know just take them to the different cool places around here. Great. I'm Terry Ann Funk, uh, owner of Clint River Adventures in St. Paul, Virginia. Um, we've been in business for three years and we've sent over 5,000 people down the river thus far. And uh, just thankful uh, to God uh, just for His grace and for blessing us um, throughout the last three years. Um, we have actually a couple of ideas. Our first idea is, of course, we want to expand our current business. We have tubing, canoeing, and kayaking currently. Uh, but, of course, we want to get in on the fishing side of it. Um, there's a lot more money to be made on that section um, and that area, so we want to incorporate that on the Clinch River. Um, of course, the Clinch is the most biodiverse river in the U.S., and it's not really utilized uh, by many people, really just us in the middle of the Clinch, and then there is an outfitter up the river, and I guess you want to utilize it as well. Um, but uh, we want to tell everyone about the Clinch. You know, a lot of people know about the New River, um, all these different rivers, but the Clinch is so special to not only St. Paul, Virginia, which it runs directly through St. Paul, Virginia, it's very, very important to Southwest Virginia as a whole. Um, we want to expand again into the fishing area. We also want to add paddle boards, um, but we also, uh, we have the land ready to go for um, a campground as well as RV sites. Um, and I'm sure you all think, come on, a campground, RV sites, what in the world? So Spearhead Trails is located there. Um, there's a couple of campgrounds <coughs> there, and they stay booked all the time. And there's tons of people that are leaving. Uh, they come in, they want to stay, and they can't because they don't have the lodging. So, of course, we, we want to get into the cabin side of it and everything, but uh, the quickest, easiest route is, of course, camping and the... Um, and just the RV hookups. But we want to cross, uh, we actually want to take ecotourism and glamping and mix it. So it will be glamping uh, is kind of like glamorous camping. Um, so we want to actually offer glamping in Southwest Virginia uh, to not only pull the people um, coming to the river and coming to the trails, but we also want to get those high-end people in too. So, so anyways, we try to pull from every, every section, uh, just all classes of people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jack Flannery. I'm North 40 Airsoft, North Virginia. Uh, we're a 10 acre airsoft field um, located in the Dorchester area. Uh, they don't know what airsoft is. You take a paintball and you put in a really real looking gun and mark it down to a little plastic BB that's six millimeters across. And you put base protection on and you go out and shoot your buddies. <laughs> um, our customer base ranges from 11 year olds to 60 something year olds that come play with us. Um, we've had uh, fathers and sons come out now. It's just been an amazing roller coaster ride since we opened up uh, almost four years ago now. Um, we're expanding out and doing regional games, just instead of my old 10 acre field. Uh, last October, we got to go into Tazewell Fairgrounds. Had a large game, about 60 people showed up there. That's, that'll be Clinch here. That's what I'm sure I'm wearing. Uh, we're going to do Battle of Clinch 2 already in Lincolnshire Park in Tazewell. And I'm looking for bigger venues um, fields, farms, warehouses, factories, anything that's been shuttered for a while that the owners would mind leave doing a weekend lease or something for a bit of money. Um, whatever that is, we're also pointing into an actual physical location out in town because right now we're open on the weekends. We got up there, uh, just done a small expansion. We opened an actual pro shop on the field, which means I'm not selling out of the tent anymore. Uh, I've actually got a roof under my head, and I don't have to carry everything from my house up to the field you know, back to my house again after the show, after the game's over. Um, but I'm happy to be a part of the. Uh, Experience here again with Katie and the gang, but uh, just looking forward to having fun, meeting everybody, and doing some network. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jack. Hi, my name is Daniel White, and I've been running a goat sheep farm 
farm. Um, it's called Born Free Farm. And basically we raise goats and sheep. Um, we're looking at expanding our business to doing um, an artisan cheese making facility. Also we're located on the Powell River, which is home to many endangered species of mussels. And um, we would also like to encourage ecotourism. I plan on doing that um, by um, hopefully expanding our business to help <coughs> encourage tourism in the region um, by possibly doing um, bike rentals, um, possibly river rafting also, um, and just um, looking at maybe an eco-tel for the future. Um, we, that right now we only have one um, motel in Lee County in Jonesville, so it's it's kind of discourages people from coming to our area, but it is beautiful out there, and um, there is um, a lot to do along the river, and there's uh, just, we just like to create fun, not only for the local residents, but we would also like to um, encourage more people to come and visit. Um, also, we're looking at getting, um, applying for grant funding, uh, possibly to do some sort of teaching facility for um, organic farming. And we um, currently um, just had received grant money for um, a, a high tunnel. And we're going to start growing uh, vegetables in, in there and, and hopefully be able to do the cheese making also. And, um, it's kind of a, a, a unique situation we've got. So <laughs> got several options and just just kind of you know, see where that goes. Sounds great. Thank you very much. <laughs> my name is Randall Mullins, and this is my webmaster and star student, Gabriel Parker. <laughs> and um, I run down to Earth Academy, and we serve students, uh, we serve homeschool students of pretty much all ages and subjects. Um, a lot of our businesses, high school students who have the trouble passing the math test or the physics or the, uh, you know, getting that paper in on time, um, passing that SAT or ACT. Um, I have people who are, um, people who are college graduates who are trying to take the, uh, um, what do you call it, the praxis, uh, other types of college and entrance exams. Uh, we help uh, people who are online college students who are having trouble with those online essays, or especially with those online math or science classes. Um, I also run martial arts classes. Uh, I try to incorporate how to grow food and how to find food in the wild in all of our science classes, because uh, they don't they do that in school very much, and food is kind of important. Um, so our mission is to serve any educational need that's not already being met in the region. Um, and also, as far as employing, I don't know if you guys have noticed how many people are running around with bachelor's degrees and even master's degrees sometimes can't find a job. I'd like to hire those people and utilize their skills to be able to teach, especially the subjects like accounting and other things that uh, aren't my specialty, because uh, I'd like to be able to serve everyone in the region. All right. Excellent. Now, you know, when I was going to be last, I was excited about it. Now, I'm going to stutter. You're not last. I got that wrong. Oh, I'm so glad. Okay. I'm fine. Don't be nervous. Um, my name is Eva Foley, and my husband and I um, own Adventure Mendota. We opened on in May of this year, and we do tubing and kayaking on the North Fork of the Holston River in Mendota, Virginia. And our plan of expansion for 2016 is pretty simple. We're not going to do much different. We're still going to be tubing and kayaking, but we um, we were only open five days a week. We will expand to seven days. Um, we just didn't have the manpower for five. And we um, will also have one upriver route, and we're going to um, market. We have a cottage on site that we have not really marketed, and we're going to work on marketing that. And, and uh, So basically, we're going to continue doing what we're doing with additional resources and try to do them a lot better than we did. 
Jack Van Hook, uh, owner of JN Tool and Supply, located in Bristol, Virginia. Uh, I travel around to construction job sites with a vehicle that is stocked with tools, fasteners, safety equipment, uh, where the guys don't have to leave the job site and go to Lowe's, Home Depot, fasten all. Um, my goal is to expand uh, more so in another vehicle, probably in Lee County, Wise County, Scott County. Uh, travel from Withful down and over to Kentucky Line. So just looking to expand with inventory and probably another vehicle on the road. All right, awesome. Thank you. Awesome. You forgot about me. Oh, yeah, and this, and this woman here. My brain's behind this. <laughs> you're going to hear about that. We're going to tease him about that now for six weeks. That's fine. Okay. Um, I'm Brooke Hilton, and I'm the co-owner of Kids Play Therapy, also located in Marion. We have a good group from Marion here. And my co-owner is sick today, so my husband at last minute decided to come and support me. We have, provide therapy services, occupational and speech therapy services to children with a variety of disabilities from birth up into their early 20s. And we work with them on any, any part that they need to be more successful in their life. Um, we also have a contract with Mount Rogers that we do early intervention, home-based services, and we've been providing those for a while, so we expanded to the clinic. What we saw was that a lot of kids, once they aged out at three, were not getting the services any longer. So that was our first step in the business. We've kind of got a couple phases that we want to go through. A uh, big area that we're seeing that's not being met for our kids is they're not able to participate in sports or play groups because of their disability, so we're trying to help bridge that gap and be a stepping stone for them. So our uh, thing that we'll be uh, projecting here will be working on providing groups, uh, group therapy sessions for the kids uh, that will target those social skills that a lot of kids do not need that will help them be more successful and transition into activities out in the community. And we'll, again, those will cover all ages from birth all the way through to early adulthood. Um, and the next phase we would like to see is where there's not a lot of providers that are willing to go to the home and do pediatrics, especially towards Carroll County, Grayson County, Galax area. So we're hoping to provide more staff that will help cover um, services that are needed in that area. So we definitely feel like it's calling on our lives. And so it's our heart. Those kids are our heart. And the more the families have come to us, the more we see a need. So we've just tried to be able to expand to further meet the needs of, of our children. All right. Okay, will you turn to the table beside you and say, good job. 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 Yes. And you should have heard people talking that you want to meet and network with and partner with. So be sure you get together with those people. So I'm going to introduce Ernie Maddie now, who's going to give you all the good details. Love it for me. Well, that was exciting. Now I'm going to bore you a bit. <laughs> um, what, what I'm going to go over real quickly, uh, so we can get to some more exciting success stories, uh, just the guidelines and the rules to make you eligible to actually receive the grants at the end of the uh, six-week course, and then what you can use that grant money for at the end of the six-week course. So if you'll get in your packet, you'll, there's some forms in there that we're going to need you to sign and return tonight. Um, you'll see there's four forms that need to be signed and returned. Okay. It'll say it right at the very top sign. No, it doesn't. All right. You're that for me. Uh, well, the first one, it says the uh, guidelines acknowledgement. You'll find two copies of that. One is for to sign and return, and then one's for you to keep for your own records. Uh, we'll just real quickly go through them. Um, Kitty mentioned some of these. You do have to attend all six sessions of the classes and the pitch night. Uh, you have to do an, uh, roughly about an eight minute presentation on October, somewhere around October 20th uh, in front of a panel of judges and you do have to uh, submit your business plan no later than that day as well. Um, a lot of you should already have a business plan probably because all of you are already in business. Um, obviously the key they're going to be looking for is, is what your expansion plans are, what your job creation goals are, and how you plan about knowing about those. So you'll be you're not rewriting a complete business plan, you're actually adding to what you've already spent your, probably the last time you had the class of this put together. Um, it says you've read, did you send them all of the requirements? She's already emailed you. I keep asking, and I know Robin's on top of it, I don't know why I asked her. Uh, you, did your 
saying that you have read and you understand all the program requirements, and you confirm that your business is not a unit of government or a nonprofit. So the key, it does have to be a for-profit business. Um, we've included in this thing here as well your uh, the business plan scorecard and pitch night assessments. This just gives you an idea of what the judges will be looking for when you're doing your presentations and what the uh, judges are looking for when they do get a hold of your business plans. Um, you understand that you, <clears throat> you are required to provide progress reports and document that ex uh, expansion through a performance agreement. That performance agreement will be drawn up after the winners are chosen, kind of based off what your expansion plan is and uh, the number of jobs and things like that you are going to create. The next one is very key here. All of the, the majority of the money that is put up as grants to my Southwest Virginia Opportunity Group has job creation goals attached to it. That's why they're requiring job creation goals to this. So if you are are you selected as the first place winner, uh, there is a minimum of two full-time equivalent jobs to be created and retained for a 12-month period. Uh, full-time equivalent can be two part-times equals one full-time. Um, and all of that is in your guidelines to give you the number of hours and things that would help you meet those goals. Uh, second place is required to meet uh, one full-time equivalent, and then third place is uh, one part-time job. And I believe we discussed it and agreed to it. If you're not going to create two jobs and you have the best one, you can still win second or third. So it, it, they'll take it into account what you put into your business plan. So it is very important to make sure your business plan details the number of jobs that you plan on creating. Um, number seven, the, the, the business has to be in uh, Winnewisco, Cumberland Plateau, or Mount Rogers Planning District. You don't have to have a business in all three of those. <laughs> We'd love for you to put one in all three of those, but how do we know where those are? Like I'm, I'm just saying in the Whitford that it's okay. that's in Mount Rogers. Okay. Yep. And then this is one you do have to sign. They want we need you to initial each of the uh, items there and then sign and Robin will pick these up before everybody leaves this evening. Any questions on any of the guidelines? We want to be very, very important that you know what needs to be done. So we don't want you to get to the end of the, and go through all these six weeks, do your business plan, do your presentation, and then not be eligible because there's something you didn't understand. So we want to make sure everybody understands the what's required to actually be a winner. Uh, the next one that needs to be signed is your award guidelines and the uh, use of funds. Um, the money can go to pretty much any business uh, related expense. <clears throat> it goes through them here, uh, purchase or lease equipment, property, uh, supplies, raw materials, overhead like your rent and utilities for the, a location, a website, brand development, or any other marketing materials that you may need. Uh, the money can be used for that. And you, um, make sure you pay attention to the, uh, the process of what it takes. They're just, if you win the $20,000, they're not going to give you a check that night. They might give you the big check for $20,000, but you, you don't get $20,000 cash to hopefully do what you said. It's going to be, you'll be providing invoices to Robin, and um, we can make the payments directly to your vendors if you're buying equipment or some big ticket items so you don't have to front that money. Uh, a lot of it will be on reimbursement basis from uh, the smaller items. And this is <clears throat> another one, the second page there does need to be uh, signed and returned to Robin before you leave. The next two things in there, three things in there, just give you an idea of um, these are the guidelines that we're using when we're judging what you've done over the course of the six weeks your business plan and the pitch night. Um, the actual business plan is going to, uh, it's worth 75% of the, your total score. So obviously it's very key to, to get the business plan updated. To We just don't want you to turn in the one you've already done. <laughs> they, they take into account what you learned in these classes and add to the business plan. And then the presentation, um, any visual aids, the viability of the business plan is the other 25% that will be counted. Um, at the end of the competition. 
The next page is your, this is just kind of what the judges will be judging you on on your pitch night. So it'll give you an idea of what areas you need to make sure you pay attention to and, uh, when you're moving forward and planning and practicing your pitch night. Feel free to let your family judge you when you're practicing these at home. <clears throat> We're doing these competitions around the state. Uh, I went to, I probably saw 60 presentations this year. And the uh, best ones that we saw were the ones that practiced every single time they went to class. They did the, they did the homework and practice, and you could tell the difference. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was wondering, um, in our entrepreneur challenge, we weren't allowed to use PowerPoint. Is that still the same? You can use it in this one. Okay. And it, will it be in this room? Or is it a different um, location? The pitch presentations are going to be at the higher education. Any other questions? Do we have to sign this marketing release, the public yeah. release form? Mm -hmm. What about the medical? Library? Yeah, we're getting to that. The, the, those are the other two that will need to be done. The, the large packet in there, this is just what the judges that uh, look at your business plan will be looking at. It, it gives you a very good breakdown of what should be in each section of your business plan and the amount of detail that needs to be in each of those sections. We were just giving you all the scoring criteria so you would know it going forward as you're building this uh, new business plan for this competition. And then the last two she mentioned there is your uh, medical liability waiver and the uh, that's not it. <laughs> the uh, marketing release. And the other one is your publicity release form, just if they, some of these videos and pictures will be on the, the website, so they need you to give them your release to do that. And again, Robin will pick up the four that have a place for your signature on. Any questions on any of that? And good luck. and I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Economic Development and Engagement for UVA WISE and part of the steering team um, that brought this uh, program and kicked off uh, the Entrepreneurship Challenge that was held in 2013. And uh, I know that Kitty uh, already recognized the steering team, but before I get into announcing or uh, introducing our next uh, speaker, I just want to say a few words about the steering team. Since the, I guess, July of 2012, this steering team has been working to try to get a buzz around entrepreneurship in the region to help develop a culture of entrepreneurship in the region. And um, so many different types of projects we've been working on, but they work so hard at the variety of different efforts and initiatives. Anytime you do something for the first time, it's hard. It's harder whenever you do it for the first time and then you perfect it as you go on. And so this team has worked um, tremendously um, hard and really well together to pull some of these types of programs together. So we really appreciate, you know, as you think through um, taking the most and making the most out of the next six weeks experience. Because we pulled together a really neat program with a lot of neat speakers and a lot of educational opportunities. And so I just really encourage you to be in the moment, to be present, not just physically, but also mentally. And I know that that's hard with you guys are already business owners, so you've got half a dozen other things that are pressing fires for you. When you finish tonight, you've got to go and take care of. So you're going to be investing time in every single week for the next six weeks through this competition. Make the most of it and try to not only just learn from the content, but also network and establish relationships in the cohort. We found that in some of the things we've done in the past, that has been one of the biggest benefits is trying to find ways that you can be able to connect with each other. So one of the things that we pull together for tonight's, um, uh, tonight's agenda is to hear of a, uh, a person who has, a, a company who has uh, started in this region, taking um, opportunities that, you know, owning land, uh, trying to figure out a, a great way to use the land, trying to figure out uh, the whole customer service aspect, taking aspects of, of what they do internally about making a product, and then also looking at a marketing strategy and then expansion strategies um, to try to grow their business um, to the point where they have award-winning uh, product. And so the person who's going to be speaking to you tonight is David Lawson with Mountain Rose Vineyard. Uh, it is a vineyard that's 
located in Wise. It is on um, pretty special land. I'm sure he'll talk to you about why that land makes um, is a special ingredient or a special component um, for uh, the wines that they make. They are award-winning wines that are made right here in our area. And um, Dave is going to talk to you for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, but we also want to encourage questions. And I'm sure uh, around the table, as he goes on, you'll have a number of questions. And uh, so don't hesitate to ask questions from David, because I think that he's, he's got a, a great experience. And he'll talk about his, um, it's a family-owned uh, business. So I think that he'll talk about some of his partners in crime, uh, as far as uh, managing the, uh, the winery and the vineyard. But let's, um, I guess, join me in welcoming uh, David Long. Thanks for, uh, for him inviting me. Um, we have a little short uh, video that's on our website. And, um, and she said partners in crime. That's true because uh, actually uh, Suzanne Devil booked herself tonight. So she had another meeting and she said, can I go? And I said, I can go, but it's not quite the same quality she is. <laughs> um, she's a much better uh, prolific speaker than I am, but uh, I'll do the best I can. Um, she also told me she gave me like 15 of my handouts. So, I'll, I'm, there's more than 15 groups of people. We'll see if maybe they can make a couple copies if anybody wants one. Um, but we'll have to look at. Yeah, can you even open the TV player? That's not the TV player side. Oh, okay. Yeah, it usually pops out there. Okay, well, let's see if she gets it. Um, so, we started in. Right, let's go all the way back, because um, why she's getting this going. I took a uh, an entrepreneur class in high school. Uh, the class actually was called Real. That no longer exists. There was a rural entrepreneurial. Oh, yeah, what? Action learning. Action learning. Thank you. Um, and uh, I suppose that's what got me started. Actually, um, my high school business plan wasn't the winery. Really helped. Um, I think the fact that we ended up with uh, the knowledge to make the business plan really, is, I think, is a paramount somewhat of a success because it forces you to be honest, you know, with what you're writing. Um, I'll tell you, we update errors all the time. I mean, we, we have new goals and objectives every year. We go back and look at them when we have when we have meetings. Um, I know I'm talking to kind of about uh, expansion. Um, there's not a day goes by we don't have an expansion idea. Uh, usually several. Uh, and so there's there's some level of a, a meeting that we, we decide that, okay, this is just not even close, or it's your button on the screen, maybe. Do you have Wi-Fi? Yeah. Well, then you can pick it up off the website. Um, I wouldn't smell that top. I just have to bring it. So, um... And I, I think part of the reason we were here in hmm, 2015, by 2010, we um, applied for, see, 2010, we applied for a value-added producer plant um, through the USDA, um, being a farm product that allows you to uh, be a value-added producer. The first half of the value-added producer grant, hey, um, is a, um, you had to do a strategic plan. Um, so we were looking at expanding just making wine into making alpha wine also. Um, and if you've been to my store lately, you realize I don't do alpha wine, and we'll talk about that idea. Uh, but uh, we ended up, um, we did go ahead and get a, um, after the value of the producer grant, the marketing study, we did go ahead and get the actual um, value added grant, so it's like a two part, one year you get a study done, and the study says you can do something, then you can go back and apply again to get money that's not just for like the study related. Um, and actually it helps you to make things. Um, but it's, it's not, everybody wants brick and mortar money, and other, other than it seems like this is a little bit kind of brick and mortar because you can pay for people for stuff, but you just can't build stuff with grant money. You have to find, um, uh, the best opportunity I would suggest, oh, I don't know which 
The Reclaimed Mountain has actually worked out better for us than we thought. That money is brought up the minerals from deep to demons. We think that's one of the reasons our wives are particularly nice. Really this is part of we think it's part of our unique story, reclaiming that land minus to wives. You hear people in the wineries talk about total wives. The culmination of everything related to the grid. You know, the soul, the vine, the air, the people, everything that goes into making that vine is kind of related to the Tawar. The Tawar of the mountain, all the unique places, you know. I like to drive around and just find new places in the mountains. I've been doing it for 30 years and there's still new places to find every day. Before we had the wine, we traveled quite a bit. But when we would come home, I always had this feeling that there's no place as beautiful as home. We all need to become better here at telling our story. Because it's a story that when you tell other people like to hear it, it brings you back to another time and place. I'm a five generations to be on this farm. There's a real good feeling inside that fills you up. Great mom lives a long time, out living in you. It has such unique qualities. We can find nowhere else. We feel a part of each other and a part of them. Our goal is for him to be able to do what he loves to do and present a good product and grow our community. It's that family line that comes in. I think that shows through its our Part of our family pride to make a good one. It's part of our mission and our passion. We're trying to offer more than just a glass of wine. We want to offer experience that says, this is home. they want to do and for the most part everybody in here has that same very story to tell something similar you have some passion you have some desire you um, and you have a unique opportunity trouble is we can't get outside of this area very well so I, I have to suggest to you all that that best thing we can do is all work together to make everybody get that message out 
And everybody who comes in, if you share that with one other person about somebody else's business that's here, and they get to go to visit one other person in this area, and they go back and tell one person, then in a couple years, I have, a, we have a good number of people in towns in Ohio and Michigan that they come in and we ask them why they're here. Well, their neighbor stopped by last year and shared a bottle of wine with them. And so they're back here this year because they were going somewhere they stopped by. I mean, how powerful is that if all of us, just in this room, share that experience with everybody else? I think we can make Southwest Virginia successful in something other than it's been in the past. I do have a few, so I'm going to give some of these down. If you want one, take one. If you're a group, of a, a group then we'll let you go on um, and um, just one of you share between the two of you all. Um, so, it's, uh, and if not, I'm going to let you have a, a rap card. Um, please, if you're open now for some kind of business, take your rap card. Call us back. We'll put your rap card every place. You put your rap card here. We'll, we'll do the, the computer thing that uh, I don't do so well. Um, I checked the weather on the computer. That's about it, actually. Um, because I'm on a farm, so I want to check the weather really well. Back to our. Um, their topic at hand. Um, so we had the Valley Edit producer again. Um, we wanted to, Wise County was known, if you're very old, you know that Wise County used to have a lot of apples. So everybody kept asking about apples. It just seemed a natural fit. Why don't you, uh, why can't we make apple wine from other apple products? So um, part of our, our grant, um, the first year we got this nice, um, handout. So this is a whole strategic plan for a variety of grow apple. It's quite detailed. Uh, there may even some pages you can see we've drunk wine next to it because there's some stain on there. Um, I'll be glad we'll either pass it around or let you look at it. Um, you can kind of see there's a lot of different discussions of what's in here. The, um, the bottom line was that they told us that apple wine doesn't sell for as much as, as, as premium wines. So the, the uh, money that we could generate between making apple wine and the money we could generate making premium wines, well, the premium wines made more money. Um, so he said, well, then you don't need to necessarily expand your business to apple wine if premium wine makes more money. Now, mind you, there was probably an acre or two of orchard already kind of in the ground before we had this discussion. Huh? Um, um, so sometimes you kind of jump the gun a little bit, but you kind of like, well, you have got several years before your trees will, will be uh, old enough to bear to, to continue to make, to make wine. Like I said, we make our deals. Now what's really huge? Hard cider, right? So had I had the orchard, didn't make any alcohol wine, I could have jumped right into hard cider. I have lots of stats of paper at home that have a uh, strategic plan wrote out for hard side. I'm not selling any yet. The numbers just don't make it, you know. Um, not on a small scale, it's it's not just numbers, because you can see I, I love growing grapes, right? That's what I like to do. Um, but the numbers have to be there first, right? Because if you can't make any with it, and if it doesn't pay for itself and you're going to do more work, that doesn't seem helpful in the long run. You can't sustain it over time. Um, there is some level of, that, of realism that you, you have to... You, I'm a dreamer. Um, Suzanne's a dreamer. My father, who's the first part of our family, is a realist. Um, if there was just up to Suzanne and I, there'd be a lot of not misshapen ideals that never kind of finished, you know. Like, uh, like I said, you know, I tell the new ones every day. Um, uh, I'll be honest, I didn't have one on the way over here. I, I did, actually. I, got into, uh, a lot of, I thought about timber business, but you know what I mean. Uh, it's always popping up for me. Um, so there were a couple, you know, some questions. If you look at the handout, you're making an expansion. So part of expansion means you have to be successful. Um, I don't think success is just money. 
because not everybody, there's businesses that don't, they go out of business and they have money, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a drive that, that is missing. Um, they get burned out. Um, I think lots of things get burned out. Um, they don't have management. We'll, we'll talk about that all often enough. But from a long time ago, I've always thought there's two types of entrepreneurs. Now, I've seen about everybody in this room, and you all are all the same type as me. I won't put that in there, but maybe not. There's one or two, maybe I've heard that might be different. So the two types. There was those who are really passionate about what they're doing. They really like this idea that they've got going on. Um, generally for them, generally, success is, is, is hard fought. It takes a longer period of time. It's much more rewarding to them because that's their ideal, right? They, they brought that up from the ground. The other ones, I, in my mind, I think Mark Warner. Um, if you know Mark Warner from a long time ago, not the political man, but the businessman, Mark Warner took money and gave to computer companies in outside of D.C. And he bought 25% of the companies when he gave them the money. That was the deal that he had made. He made a lot of money because, well, technology, internet, computer, just booming. Uh, this was in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, he saw an opportunity. These businesses needed capital to build their product. He invested in those. He made money because it was a good opportunity. So that's the second type of entrepreneur, is those who see an opportunity. Maybe they're not crazy necessarily about what it is. They don't dislike it, but, you know, they, they see an opportunity. They want to explore that opportunity. So you have those, those two groups of people. Um, the opportunist entrepreneur is either so high or crash hard. Because generally they, they, they have a really good idea. It just booms and takes off and, and they're in good shape. And, or it was not a good idea. They crash and they get back, back up and they do it again somewhere else. And it never pays them. Uh, those of you who've heard them, the stories, right? The people who have, uh, uh, they went bankrupt four or five times and then they're a multi million billionaire um, because they saw that opportunity and but it didn't hurt them to go on. But, you know, for all of those small people, you're going to be doing it all the time. You are doing it all the time. You've got to have some level of, uh, of passion about what, what that is you want to do. Um, and, and part of that, I'll tell you, Suzanne used to be a, an education. So we write, write stuff down. We have goals and objectives every year. Um, that's part of our business plan. We go back and look at our strategic plan. Um, we cost things out. We use um, cash flow sheets. We use uh, profit and loss statements to understand whatever that we want to do. Uh, what what direction do we need to go from that point of view? Um, I didn't bring our business plan. It now I'm a binder, um, and we add to it. It's a living thing. We go back and look at it. Um, I can't stress enough that that. That's kind of like the core of what's going on. Until you get a company big enough that you have a management team, then they still have these same things. Um, it's just they work on different parts of it. Um, that, that helps to go on. So um, what do you, I would think before you, I mean, you're here now, so you want an expansion. So what are you thinking about with expansion? Um, I looked up, um, I consolidated number two. It was on, I won't say the Small Business Bureau, but it's some small business bureau. They have 10 of them things. What should you be looking at before you expansion? Um, number one, it said you need to have good customers. Um, you know, loyal customers who come back to you um, time and again. They like whatever product you're doing. Uh, the man who sells the nails and screws. If they're looking for you every week and they got a new list for you, hey, right, that's exactly that wall customer base. They, you know, say, I can expand and get more people like that. Um, so that, you know, that's an important consideration. Um, the other part of that, are other people asking you to expand? Um, I'll be honest, we get a lot of people ask us, why are you not like, can we buy you wine in Richmond? 
so wish I could sell bottles. <laughs> alcohol is a fun project. The only thing worth making alcohol is like firearms. That's sort of regulation. There's just this, there's just a whole lot of stuff. Um, that's something we you know I, we got a new list the other day that where can we go what can we do? Um, I'll give you an idea. We're pretty close to Tennessee, right? We're pretty close to Kentucky. You know, it's a federal offense for me to, to sell wine to Tennessee right now. Um, I mean, they can come get it. Um, that's fine. Um, but I can't ship it over there to them. Um, I necessarily, to have a store over there as a farm winery, that's what we are, not a commercial winery. Uh, we looked at it, and it's pretty great. That's what I mean. Same thing in Kentucky. I can get anything in Kentucky. What's the difference between a farm winery and a commercial winery? Commercial winery. Okay, that's a good question. Um, farm winery, every state is different. Not every state has the same laws. That's one of the problems. Um, but in Virginia, we have to grow a majority of our fruit ourselves. Um, and let's see, so that's 50, more than 50% have to be grown by ourselves. Um, we have to have producing acreage where the wine is located. So if you come out there, that's why it's off the beaten trail, because it's where the, where the grapes are grown. Um, it also allows us to um, participate in a, uh, what they call BWC, which is Virginia Wholesale Distribution Company, which allows us to sell to like restaurants. Originally, it allowed us to sell directly, but we won't get into laws. It was, became illegal, and then they we made a new kind of law that's not illegal. That's the VWDC. Um, kind of somebody got upset because they thought it was internet farm, but um, uh, it's bad. <laughs> Those are some of the things. So we're small, generally speaking. We don't have quite the same classification. I can't buy outside stuff. Um, like if you look, all our wines say Virginia wine. So I'm 100% Virginia grape. Um, depends on the year almost. All my own. Sometimes I buy for a few local growers. Um, I got one or two in Lee County. Uh, I have another one up in Virginia for several years. So it's related to being on the farm in Virginia. And there's some other paperwork. The biggest one is growing for yourself. So it's your commercial though. Commercial, I could, commercial, I could, <coughs> commercial, I could truck in from Napa County. Um, or I could come in from, like, say, Lake County, California, and cheaper than you can sell it here. I could, or I could buy pre-made wine in California, bottled up, and, and ship it out. Um, I don't get the. If you've seen, there is a Virginia Wine Guide. Um, that's quite a best marketing tool. You used to be that. Um, you don't get to be put on that if you're commercial. You also pay a lot more. They are, and part of that, though, is related to the fact that, that 1981, they passed the Farm Wine Act. Don't quote me on 81, 82, 82, really early in the 80s. Uh, they passed the Farm Wine Act, forcing growers to grow it themselves, forcing the state of Virginia and Virginia Tech to figure out ways for growers to grow better quality. That quality is now coming around. Um, they're getting much more international. Knowledge base from lines as they go. Um, the winners are, are going further. Um, but it took a long time. And they still don't do a very good job. I think like 3% of all the wine drunk in France is Virginia wines. So we have a long way to go. So, but does that answer your question? I think so. I think so. You, so you're basically doing this so that you'll have the grant opportunities and, and cut down. It's on not taxes. necessarily the grant. It's the, the, you all close your ears. Mm -hmm. I'm only somewhat satisfied with that grant. It did a lot of good stuff, but it also makes you do a lot of stuff that you might not have wanted to do, but you looked in the long run, it was really good to do. <laughs> so I told them to close your ears. Um, we're actually looking for a, uh, an energy grant. We're now off of this. We're looking for like one of these uh, farms and small businesses can, can, can get energy grants. Um, so we're, you know, done with this grant a couple years ago, we're in the energy now, because um, it's more than I want to pay for energy. 
but farm lines have to really just be on the farm. Um, so, uh, I I'll think this is a good one. Number two, if you have a paper in front of you, is B, is you have to, your business should have been profitable for three years with positive steady cash flow before you think about an expansion. And, and I'm going to tailor that a little bit. Sometimes we do expansion, and I don't think you even think about it. Um, did you buy something because it was a good deal and you saved a little bit of money? In my mind, that's an expansion. You're expanding maybe that profit margin a little bit. Um, you know, can you buy, I like tools, can you buy, you know, a pallet load of something and save money? That's a small expansion. Sometimes several small expansions add up over time. Um, so, you know, but you do need to be, you do need to have some money because if you're going to expand and your success of your business is dependent upon your, your expansion, then I'm not certain that, that the first business is really ready for an expansion because there's a whole lot of eggs in one basket. Now, if it, that's like we're talking, if it's a big expansion, you really want to do something uh, either slightly different or um, really feel like it's a, a thing going on. If you don't have the money or you have to depend on the new money, well, what happens if something happens with, with that expansion? Um, unforeseen, uh, you know, sometimes things burn down, things break. Uh, you, you can come up with a whole host of problems. Somebody takes money from you, and heaven forbid that does occasionally happen. Your people go under because somebody stole money. Um, so I think you need to be in a good position to be able to make an expansion. And whether they say that or not, when they look at your business plan, if, if those numbers are really close and you've made some interesting estimates, then that can come back and bite you. And it's not to be mean, but that may be the sole reason that I don't have a bazillion things going on in my farm, is that I look at that and say, all right, this is going to cost me, you know, so many thousands of dollars, and I'm going to make about that same amount back, and it's going to take several years, or if everything goes well, I'll make, you know, three times as much, but everything might not go well. Uh, if you're in wild right now, and I know since nobody, at least you all are in wild, nobody here was from the town of wild. It's a really sad in my part. Um, I know we have lots of St. Paul, so I'm happy about that, but St. Paul is much more of a go-getter. Wild is kind of struggling. Um, Southwest Virginia is struggling. You know, there's a lot of coal out. Um, so, like in Air Wyoming, you know, we've thought about doing several things, and it's like, where are those people going to come from? I mean, there's, you know, everybody is, is losing their job. So where are those people going to come from for that expansion? Um, that, that's something to think about. Um, you know, we added this. It says, like, strong team of employees and a good operational system. If your business is not running smoothly, like, if I'm not there, I wasn't there this evening. I left. Uh, one of our sales roommates, man, she can handle the situation almost more than you want to. Um, not in a bad way, but she's very personable and, and she'll just go out and, and, and share with anybody, right? I have no worries whatsoever if, if Suzanne or I are not there that, that she can take care of, it, you know. Um, so that's part of our operational system. It's a little different on the winemaking side for us, um, and I'll be honest because if I'm not there, no wine's going to get made. There's a, I am working. I'm trying to work on a um, what we call a HASA, but it's a, it's, a, it's a whole plan. So like everybody could go in there and flip over into a book and follow exactly my procedures for everything that I do. So if I went there and something happened to me, then they could at least kind of get things done day to day and keep an eye on things. Uh, oh, but you, you got this whole list, right? Looks great. And all of a sudden, like, I need to put more in. And it's just, it's that right? So that's one of the things we're working on, is that's our operational system. How does it flow if you're not there? Because there's some point in time that you can't be there, right? You, you, you can't be married to it. Um, you, you have to be married to it, but you can't just live and breathe what's going on because everybody gets thrown down. Um, so um, I think the other question is, you know, is your market growing? Is your industry growing? Um, are you running out of space for what you're doing? You know, is there a true need 
for this expansion that you want to do. Be honest about it. Um, I, I, you know, I almost would say that if after this class, everybody wants to, to get this, but if one person did all the research and was a little bit glad that they didn't get the money because they realized that what they wanted to do really, they didn't think was going to be successful. I mean, you, you have this great ideal, but I'm not downwishing anybody, but to be realistic, you know, you may, that may say, okay, well, I don't want to do this, and then in a few weeks or months, you'll come up with a much better idea. You're like, man, I'm glad I didn't just do that. Um, so so be, be true and real about it. Um, and that kind of follows in, too, to the idea of a, a long-term planning. We do five to ten-year goals. Let, long -term planning. Let me give you an idea of long-term planning. Grapevine takes three to four years for its barren grapes. There's one or two years of soil preparation before we plant that. If it's a red grape, there's between one and two years after we've pit grapes, so now we're two, five years, at least, five years now, pit grapes, two more years before it's ready to be sold. And another year after that, before all that is ready to be sold, it's sold. Because you know, you're estimating it takes you know, about a year to make a product. So what's that, seven or eight years? So if somebody comes out today and says, you know, Merlot is really big now. I don't have to grow any Merlot. I got eight years before I can sell Merlot. <laughs> cool. You know, so some days if I'm way into the future, I'm way into the future because that means I'm thinking about the long-term success of their business. Uh, so having some long-term planning with, um, with what projects you've got going on. Um, we, we do goals, we do one year, three year, five and ten year goals. Um, so then in those terms, write down a real list, be honest. Um, I almost take somebody that is your friend you know, that you know fairly well and say, how many people do you really think is going to come uh, fishing down the river for me? You know. Um, maybe in the last three years I've seen this increase, but is that increase going to continue at that same rate? Or is there a certain level of market saturation? So that there's only a certain number of people that ever going to come fish on the river, no matter what, because that's just the quantity of number that people are. So if you've got some other people, be realistic about your numbers, right? Because it only hurts you and your business if you estimate it up here that it, it's down to your bottom. If you can, if this is your profit loss in line, hey, that's great, right? Because you know, this is, if you estimate up here and you reach this, then that's okay, but maybe you can work on getting a little bit higher. The, the last part of long term planning is really important. Um, it's an exit strategy, and I think you need an exit strategy even for this expansion. If the expansion doesn't work how you want it, and now you're working 60 or 80 hours a week on this, this project and you're making no more money on it, what can you do to get out of it? I mean, are you now stuck with this facility that you've built that you don't want to do anything with, but you still have a loan payment on it and you want to pay it on? I mean, what's that plan? Um, everybody, nobody thinks that things are going to go bad, but they do go bad. Um, and so, I think you have to be sure that you know kind of what's going on. For if you have a machine in front of you, to stay motivated. Because these are the opportunities. If you're going to do an expansion, you have to stay motivated. All of us are <coughs> motivated. I've listened to you speak tonight. Everybody's motivated for what they want to do. They want to keep going. But what happens when you've done a lot of work and things are not going successful? Things are broke down. How do you stay motivated? You know, what I didn't write down is kind of in my notes is sometimes you have to be able to remove yourself from the business so that you have a life beyond that. You know, I have little kids and they come and help me, and so that kind of gets me going on. So my kids work with me sometimes. Um, we don't have any OSHA people, not me, not all of them <laughs> with me um, from time to time. Um, so I do have to love what you're doing. Um, lots of money just, over time, lots of money is not a big motivation. And the last thing, too, if you're getting bigger, you're getting some employees, you've got to have good management. Right? You've got to have 
If you put somebody else in charge, they need to know what your goals are. They need to know how you want things done so that if you're not there, they still continue on with the passion that you want things to be followed by. And so finding good people sometimes are, are very difficult. Um, you can't be afraid to tell somebody that it's not what's working out. Um, that's why I let Suzanne do the hiring because she needs to have hundreds of employees so she can really kind of pick out people pretty well. Have we always picked out the right person? No, well, we haven't. Um, but we have picked out more good ones than bad ones. And so we find ways we can do that. So I have a couple minutes left. I'm going to kind of open these up to some questions. If you have any. Um, Um, how have you all utilized your working with other businesses in the area to cross promote? Yeah, um, we've sent a lot of people rapping for you all. So I know. You all um, Suzanne's awesome. Um, right now, Facebook is like your cheapest advertisement, period. I mean, it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. like Facebook's a new word of mouth. I will caution, though, people get on and ramble, and they can say lots of bad stuff, too. So, some control over that. Um, I have to have a business Facebook account because, well, I can't have my nieces because they would associate me and we get to 80% of our people over 21 on Facebook. That's a good question for you. Mm -hmm. Facebook is good. I think every one of you all should have a, 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 a rack card and I'll put it in my place and every one of you all put it in your place and then give your whole staff have them. Who's he? will print them for you. If you have your stuff out there, cheap and just about from just to print anybody else. Um, you can check with them, and they'll think, like, we got like 10,000 for $400, so it's like a decent speed. David, can you talk a little bit about the events that you do, like the Sip and Paint? Yeah, Sip and Paint is crazy right now. Suzanne has 20 some Sip and Paint. She likes the paint. It kind of fits. I gave her a room. I gave up some of my warehouse. I gave her a room, built a little room for her Sip and Paint. People really like it. It, it was a expansion, but the room cost me, you know, some drywall and some paint um, to finish it off. And then we buy some canvases that we kind of know ahead of time. So almost no cost. She liked to do it. If they start tailing off and, and nobody wants to do it anymore, well, then we can use something else that room or have any cost anymore. But people love to paint like that. I don't. Uh, I was just wondering, um, where, like, business-wise, mm -hmm. what was your winery at, like, doing business before you got the value out of producer grant? And then, what were you, did you have a contingency plan if you did not get approved for that? And what was that? Yeah, um, the value out of producer grant, like I said, the first year of marketing study. Um, so... I think we were, we were going to continue business the way it was, working to do some of those projects on our own. Now, um, would we have, this is my real success. If you look at that brochure, the logo came around, I don't know if they're very good producer band, with some hassling. If you see this, it's an MRV, right? See, it's a, the MRV, it's also like a rose and a wine press thing on top of it. Um, Hopefully one day you'll see that you won't think not to the future. So that was going on. We were going to do it ourselves. The, the question was, would we um, borrow money for some of the marketing advertising? Or would we learn to be more creative with marketing advertising? Because, I'll be honest, because you were a farmer. The value of the producer grant pays people to do stuff for you, pays to have like websites built, pays for you to have some marketing advertising dollars, but not necessarily building new rap cars. Um, also buys, um, what's it called? It's like the cross of good stuff. It would help you with your, um, it helped us to buy bottles, caps, and labels because it's a little bit advertising dollars um, because it has their logo and stuff on there. It's not a, um, I don't think it would buy sheep, but now would it help, and it would not buy, like, um, I think you said uh, maybe. It wouldn't buy the equipment to make cheese. It would buy you 
the labels of the bottles, half of it, right? It's only 50-50. You have to match it. Um, it only would buy you the bottles and the labels to put that cheese in there. But so were you already producing the wine then? Yes, you got the I brand? was. We okay. were going, and I'll be honest, this is maybe it was, I didn't, it wasn't clear enough. My grant said that originally we were going to expand into apple wine. We decided not to expand apple wine and expand our premium wine. So our premium wine is it's a little more expensive, it's varietal, um, and said we should stick with that. And so that's where we went with that. Um, so I kind of didn't do it. Okay. <clears throat> Real quick question because I may not get to talk to you during break. We have a, a, a Senator Warner to ask the brewers in Southwest Virginia to come up to the craft food right. trail. Mm -hmm. And in our first meeting, we, we decided we wanted to expand it to craft beverage, right. which would include you guys yeah. if you would be interested in. Yeah, and, and you come up and talk with us or, or call to me or somebody because uh, beer wine trails are a, a big thing. Um, the, the question is, we wanted to do this a couple years ago. I haven't been able to, I don't want to say that, but more right. We haven't got necessarily the right people that would help us do that with the appropriate amount of money to make it successful in the past. Um, so, but come up and, and we'll work on that. Yes. Excuse me if you already went over it, but so how did you take the leap and I guess financially start knowing you had to wait eight years for Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, um hmm. I was playing playing grapes when I was in high school. Mm, so I had a couple of acres playing before I went to college. Um that we didn't cost us money. You had a little extra money, you know, it's gonna take a trip or something and can create <coughs> The, the phone call conversation you heard from Virginia Tech was pretty simple. I, I did farm, and so I paid for college by farming, uh, mostly produce. Um, I came out of school, I had no debt. So, if I went bankrupt, what can they take from me? Right. <laughs> so you only have two options in business. If you have nothing and you lose it, you still lost nothing. <laughs> now it would have been a much different story, right? Because I have a family, I have children, um, and a lot, I would have a lot more risk involved. I also, the, I say this gently, but I owe my soul to the bank because they made me sign life insurance. If something happened to me, that they would still get their money. So that's my soul, right? If I die, they still want to get their money. Banks will get their money. Um, not everybody. We were turned down from two or three banks, to be honest, um, before we had it in. We also realized how much can you borrow and pay off if things didn't go well. Right? So if I had to get another job, um, between my mom and dad and myself, if we split it up, if, how much extra cash could we afford to pay off, pay, pay off get rid of it? Because right? it's on our farm, right? I mean, it's been there since 1850. It's not something I can't sell off. It's not out somewhere else. It, we have to keep it. So we decided how much we could afford to risk and can we do it that amount. We did for a long time. Stuff wasn't finished. Um, and so in the winter, we'd take a little bit of extra money and we'd go finish another room or we had a little thing on. And um, that's even till today, we would like to close more shade areas because it's uh, uh, have a family back of our home. So it's, Living within the means that we feel like we can spend now, it's not a big, it's not very risky, right? Because we didn't go out and borrow just a whole lot of money, and then now we have to sell, you know, X number of thousands of cases to, to pay for this. It's if we sold nothing, can I still pay for this business? You know, and that's what we thought we were safe with. Doing. It's pretty safe, and it's we thought it would be long-term growth. You know, I'm was pretty young, so I can go on. Okay, one more. Okay, first just I'm not, um, um, I don't want to compete with you. No, no, no. Just right. um, to uh, um, you know, like grow and produce my own food and drink. Yeah, and yeah. 
Do you sell cuttings or have any advice on types of grapes that do exceptionally well in Virginia? Yeah, come up, we do a cutting workshop in first beginning in April. Oh, really? Um, yes, we do cutting for every one. I just mulch them up, so. Uh, really? I'll tell you lots of good Yeah, I'll tell you that if cutting. you want to do it organically, you won't be able to do it. What? If you want to do grapes organically, you won't be able to do it. They get fungus on all of them. Oh, they, yes. Mine they do. get fungus. I realize they get, that. They get rocks, it's just. It's extremely hard. There is not a commercial certified organic vineyard in these coast. There are a few that have sustainability programs like Lyle that they are trying to do, but nobody's made it three years. Wow. Commercially, and a lot of those people have a lot of money. I mean, I, I just, you know, I'll be honest with you. That's that's the situation. So, well, let's. It doesn't take care of black products. There's no organic product. It's going to Dave will hang around for the break if you don't mind, and we all want to ask some additional questions. But let's thank Dave for his time. So what we're going to do? Look at your watch. Look at your watch, and we're going to take a five-minute break because the next speaker will kind of really talk about that expansion piece. And I'm sure you'll have plenty of questions for her. So five minutes from right now, I'll be back in your seat and we'll, uh, we'll get started and we'll wrap up. <laughs> Thank you. 
business successful over time? Are you on time with your clients? Do you, you know, are you available for them or do they have to be available for you? Do you appear to be comfortable and confident? Do you know what you're talking about? Is you, you know, do you project an image that your business is successful and it's going to be more successful or do you apologize for yourself all the time? Because that makes a difference. Do you, do you appear, uh, I'm sorry, do you appear to be sincere, honest, and trustworthy? Um, you know, my Facebook message. Uh, <laughs> so, do people believe you? Do they believe what you're selling? Do they believe what you're doing? Do they, do they believe in your mission? It makes a difference. Uh, do you appear to project your desired message? If you are a fashion designer, do you walk around in sweat pants and tennis shoes all the time? However, if you're a farm person, is that that's fine? You know. So, so are you projecting with <coughs> your pictures? Are you giving the desired message? Does your body language project the desired message? I won't say who, but Sandy and I occasionally um, are in a meeting with someone who starts the meeting out by apologizing for their lack of um, speaking skills. Well, I tell you, if you start out <coughs> telling people what's wrong with you, they're going to find some more things. <laughs> Don't do it. And are you prepared? And when I say are you prepared, I mean in your, in, if, if you've got something that you're selling, do you know your product? Are you prepared to sell it at any point in time to anybody that you meet? If you have a service that you're selling, again, is, is, is the service industry prepared to, for that client, that last minute client? Because, you know, we can all plan and we like those customers to make appointments and do all that, but, you know, that's not what builds your business or your business's character. What builds your character is how you can serve your customers. I'll just give you a, a good example right this minute. I asked Catherine for two dozen cupcakes, and she's going to deliver them tomorrow. Now, you think I would buy some more cupcakes? Catherine, so, charge extra for that? <laughs> that's right. And you know what? And, and that's a very good thing, yeah. Hit your arrow on, the, on your iPad. Put it on full screen. You do it. So, so let's talk about image and perception. Are you friendly? If you've had a bad day, or let's just say there's something wrong. I, I have a friend that's going through a divorce. There's something wrong all the time. But, you know, do you carry your problems to work with you? Because I tell you, your customers have got their own problems. They don't want to know about yours. As a matter of fact, I, I heard this guest speaker speak one time, and she said, honey, don't go around telling everybody your problems. Half of them don't care, and the other half are glad. <laughs> <laughs> she might have been right. So are you friendly? Are you courteous? Is your business clean? You know, and, and when I say your business clean, I know that some of your outdoor adventures and, and farms, and, you know, I understand that there are differences in levels of cleanliness. However, are your kayaks, are, is water, you know, cleaned out of them every time, or the mud, or the, you know, whatever. You know, is it comfortable for that customer to jump in that kayak or to walk or to go pet that? Alpaca. Alpaca. I was going to say llama. <laughs> I was going to say llama, and I knew that was it. But, you know, cleanliness is very important to the customer. And I'll tell you something else. Your bathrooms in your business. Are your business bathrooms clean? Do they have toilet paper? Do they have something to wipe their hands on? I made a mistake one time in the beauty shop. I got tired of buying paper towels because people waste them. So I put the, you know, the towel that you wrap your hair up with when you get out of the shampoo bowl. I put one in there. Well, people 
were not happy about that. And it took me just a little while to figure out. But they were, you know, or kind of fussing about it or asking for pure ale or, you know, because once one of those wet, uh, cloth towels is used, gets wet, in a lot of people's mind, that is somebody else's germs. So, you know, I, again, I learned that lesson, but it took me a while. Uh, so all this is customer service, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. But telephone I lost many a customer talking on the telephone personally while I was spending that 30 minutes of that person's time, even though it might have been a basic haircut, because the name of my business was the male ego, so guess who our target market was? So, and you know, a man's haircut is pretty easy to do if you've done it for even 15 years, you kind of do it, you know. But that's not what they're paying for anyway. They're paying for your time and your attention. So telephone etiquette, and you can apologize all you want to, and you can go, yeah, just one minute. I'm, I... Telephone etiquette is a very big deal. <clears throat> there, we're in the information technology world, and again, what you are doing with your business is this. That lady has my money in her pocket, and it's my job to get it out. These things are what allow you to get that money out of, out of that customer's pocket. And, and is it comfortable for them to be your client? Do they feel invited? Every client, you should look at every client as somebody you want to come to your party. Because that's what it is. Your business is your party, and you're inviting me. You've got a very small market in Southwest Virginia. You're lucky if you can draw people from 30 miles. But if you have done that, you need to know how to get them back. They'll come once. And everybody's business is the same, but they have to, they have to feel good about it. It has to look good, feel good, smell good, and sound good to them. If it doesn't, the guy down the street will take care of them. So, okay. So, again, you're, we're still creating our image or we're rebuilding our image. Again, the appearance of your business, we've already done that. Um, have you targeted your market? Because you will accept any customer, but frankly, Markets are different. People are different. They're going to be, you're not going to gear adventure <coughs> toward somebody's 10-year-old. You're going to gear your business toward the 10-year-old's mom and dad. So, or the tourist. Or the, you know. So, so have you decided um, who your market is? And have you geared your business toward that? If you haven't, and, and again, it's never too late. If you started the business and you've already made a few mistakes, tomorrow's a new day. Don't apologize. Don't beat yourself up. Everything that you do wrong is just a lesson. And if you, you know, if, if you spend too much time going, oh, God, I wish I would have done that. You know, you're, you wasted 15 minutes. Nothing you can do about the past. All you can do is move forward and, and fix them. So... When you opened your business, did you research other businesses like yours? Did you know what made them successful? What made you open a business like that? What was the, what was the motivator? Did you find out from those people what worked and what didn't work? Did you experience in those businesses yourself things that you thought you could do better. You know, did, did you think about that? Because especially in service industries, they're very easy to open. Those businesses are extremely easy to 
put a shingle up, go to the town hall, buy a business license, and say, come on down to my business, I'm going to take care of you. But have you actually thought about how you're going to take care of them? Because every single client that walks in your door is different. They've got different needs. They've got different personalities. They've got different lifestyles. But they all have some sort of money to spend. Even the lowest paid wage earner in your town has or will, even if they don't have it, they will spend some sort of entertainment dollar, whether it's on a pack of chewing gum or a tour down the river or an anniversary in a bed and breakfast. Take their kids to the alpaca or to the <laughs> alpaca farm. <laughs> yeah, I got it. See the llamas. We're, we're <laughs> so, so when you research this business, and if you didn't, start asking the customers that you have. We've got a suggestion box over there. Could you just write something down that you like about my business and something you wish I could improve? going to hurt. You know, they're going to tell you. People are going to be really brutally honest, especially if they can do it anonymously. <laughs> and they're happy to do it. And, you know, that's free market research. I don't know about you all, but when I, had, uh, when I opened my business, I didn't have a whole lot of money to spend on things like that. So customer service was the number one thing. Now, we do have social media now. People have to like you enough to even sign on. So social media means they gotta like you. They gotta want to be part of your uh, playoff, you know. They, they want to be part of your mission. So you know, keep that in mind. And is everybody that's involved in your business on the same page? Because if they're not, I can tell you that you are going to create chaos. If you and your husband are in a business together, and your husband thinks one way and you think another, you probably better be on the same page before you start talking to the, to the customer. And I tell you for sure that my husband and I can talk for 30 minutes, and he's a, a mechanical engineer, and we can talk for 30 minutes about something, and we can agree on something, and tomorrow somebody will get him to change his mind. <laughs> And so I've had to start getting him to write it back and sign it. Just so that I'm sure we're on the same page when it comes to certain things. And that makes a huge difference. You can't tell your customer one thing today and something else tomorrow. And you can add to your policies, but you can't, you can't do that to people. Because there's a business just like yours down the road. Okay, so once you've done all of those things, and, and before we start this, let's talk about let's talk about some other things that you all have encountered that you find to be customer service obstacles. Anybody got one? Or anybody got a suggestion of, yeah. of more customer service? One well, problem is they don't want to pay you. Okay, so uh, you offer service. what you charge. <clears throat> Okay. Believe me, I, I dealt with that, you know, as a hairstyling salon, all of my relatives wanted haircuts <laughs> until I started charging for them. I went through that too when I was doing a haircut. And three-fourths of my relatives started going to somebody else that was charging as much money as I was. <laughs> Equipment you have, uh, because you have such a wide array of customers. Equipment for customers. Equipment covers customer needs. Okay. Right. Okay. So people people don't want to charge you. What are you going to do? I mean, don't want to pay what you charge. What are you going to do about that? Maybe You've already got an existing business. Be more clear about what is expected.
respect it up front or uh, make it very clear about your policy for payment? And if you don't have a policy, put one plan and so adhere to it. You might want to do market research and make sure that your, your prices are aligned with the market for the area. Because, and I can tell you, uh, we had a situation that if you took all of Virginia and averaged this person's salary on a, on a Virginia scale, they should have been making $150,000 a year. But here in Southwest Virginia, 75 is a great starting income. So yes. The market, what you have. Okay? So, up front, so if you have not been able to lure a client, is that what you're talking about, or getting them to pay you afterwards? Both. Mostly getting them to pay you afterwards. Uh, I've had people where, you know, they hire me for, say, two hours, I end up having to work for They're like, no, oh, pay you for two. But the work needed to be done for that child to pass their test. So, what does that imply? That you need a, a contract. contract. Yep. You need a contract. You need for that parent to sign a contract mm -hmm. that says, I understand that the, the estimate is two hours. Mm -hmm. However, it I agree to pay between a two and five hour time frame. My policy is to try to do this as expedient as po expediently as possible in order for all parties to be happy with the end result. You tell them up front. Okay, so time. Who said time? Give me an example. Um, like we do end up doing construction with weathers and back there or things given away or we were emergency services once someone's probably stabilized. Construction contracts. It, contracts don't have to be long, drawn out, you know, legal documents that you pay a lot of money for. They can be something that you typed up on the, you know, on a Word document and they read it and you read it and you both agree to it and, you know, and, and then you go about your business. Equipment to meet customer needs, that is probably an animal that has to do with financing. So let me get through this and then we'll talk about equipment and and needs versus want. <laughs> okay, so job creation, and this is the most important part of, of this session tonight because we had people that didn't sign up for this because they didn't think they could create two jobs. So, do you know, um, how to create a job without creating unemployment because I know there's some seasonal businesses in this room. If you have seasonal employees, do you use their downtime to prepare for the coming season? Have you figured your pay structure? Are you paying them a per hour rate? Are you paying them a per hour plus commission? Are you paying them commission only? Do you know what the Department of Labor standards are when it comes to commission pay? or tips, because those are very important things for you to know. And I, you know, I'll be glad to talk to you again about those rules, but there are some rules, and you can go to the Department of Labor website, and you can read those rules. Basically, whatever they take home has to equal $7.35 an hour, because that's minimum wage right now. So, Affordable Care Act does not apply to people who have under 50 employees. Period. <laughs> no exceptions. So I don't think anybody in this room is going to have to worry about that. I had somebody the other day tell me they couldn't participate because they couldn't afford the insurance. But probably we're not going to have 50 employees. If we do, we're lucky. I'm glad to pay for your insurance mm -hmm. if I can get 50 employees in my business. Okay, I have a quick question about that. Um, I'm not familiar with the act at all. Is that for full-time employees only or also part-time and how much? How many hours? Anybody over 30 uh, hours, I believe, Carl may be able to answer this question it's better than 30 I. 30 hours, and then 
your part timers, you add them all together and you divide it by 120. And that gives you your number of what they call full time equivalents. So it's full time is 30 hours, which should state it. And then you have to calculate your part timers. Mm -hmm. And basically, what you do is you add all the hours for the month mm -hmm. together, divide it by 120, that gives you a number, mm -hmm. and that's your full time equivalent. So three 10 hour people would be one full time person. Yes. yes. Gotcha. Thank you. And also, um, on September the 29th, we're going to have an HR expert here to talk about that um, labor relations, the whole um, wage issues, and the Affordable Care Act. So we'll get a little deeper into that right. on the 29th. Okay, so let's, so let's move on. And so, so in your business, and I don't care what my business it is, do you upsell? Do you only sell your product or do you upsell? You're a teacher, do you have pencils and pens to sell? <laughs> Rulers or magic markers or whatever it is? Do you have life jackets and water shoes? River shoes. River shoes. We went in the shoe business this summer. Right. <laughs> in a big way. Right. <laughs> Catherine's got cupcakes. Gosh, I don't know. Fat blockers. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> because I know Catherine, but, but honestly, there are not enough customers in Southwest Virginia for you to only sell your service and for you to only sell a few products. If you've got a service, you better have some products to go with it. If you've got products, you better have a service to go with it. You know, there's just not enough customers. There's 55,000 people in Washington County, Virginia. I don't know about the other counties, but, you know. Okay, so upset. Do you allow your employees to represent and network your business in, uh, in community involvement opportunities like Rotary, Kiwanis, Chamber of Commerce? Do you pay for their membership dues? If they're good employees, is that part of their job? For them to network for you all the time. Do they have their business cards with their name on it? Do they go with you to a business meeting? Do you make them part of your organization? Do you treat them as if they are important? to your business, because they are. Quickly, your financial projections. I refer to your financial projections as Republicans and Democrats. When you're starting your financial projections or if you're moving forward, in my humble opinion, your revenues should be conservative and your expenses should be very liberal. And in your expenses, you need to have a line item in there that says, miscellaneous because there's always something else going to come up that you didn't plan on whether it's higher insurance rates, gas, you know, whatever. Okay, so do you keep your weekly and monthly tax deposits if you have employees or if you're self-employed, do you keep those things paid? Or are, or are you at the end of a quarter going, oh my gosh, I owe $6,000 and there's $4,000 in the bank account and i got to buy some new supplies. If you pay those, those things weekly, you will be so happy with yourself. <laughs> so happy with yourself. <coughs> I, the other gentleman spoke about this, but expansion is a calculation. Give me about one more slide and I'll be done. Expansion is a calculation, and, and again, if you've got a floor space, if something isn't making you money in every corner except where you need to stand and where your employees need to stand, you don't need to expand. You know, big and beautiful is not, doesn't work in the business world. You want every piece of your floor space to be making some kind of dollar. Okay, and we're on the last slide. And this is my very favorite saying when it comes to business. Yes, research your market. Yes, look at what other people are doing. Yes, make sure that you are trying to provide something different, something better, something value added for your business. But don't drive by the Crooked Road General Store every day and see how many of your customers are coming out her door. 
Don't pay attention to somebody else's business as far as its daily operations. Pay attention to the things that you have to do for yourself to make your business successful. And I'm going to go back one more time to this job creation thing. Sit down and make a to-do list. And for this to-do list, you, you all have had a business open now for a while. On this to-do list, I want you to write every single thing that you have to do in your business to make it successful daily. And then I want you, and, and remember that there are only eight hours in a day. And you've got to figure out how much time it's going to take you for each one of these things on your to-do list. And I want you to put your name beside the things that you think you can do. And then I want you to put your employee's name by the things that you might need your employee or you think they can do. And include marketing, include networking, include buying supplies. You've got cleaning. You've got, you know, whatever it is you have for your business. And then everything that's left, bookkeeping, everything that's left, you need to put down that you're going to have to pay somebody else that, that has a business to do that. And you may find that you either don't have enough employees or creating that second job isn't going to be that big a deal because you have more things to do than there are hours in the day. So with that, I will, I will give you about two or three minutes of questions if you have any questions or comments. And uh, I'm sorry we went real fast, but we don't want, we don't want to leave you here all night. So, you have any questions? Could you send us that? That was really good. I can. Well, I, okay, so again, if you will just send me that email and ask me, then I'll attach it to send it to you. Can also send it to me if you want, or I'll ask for it and send it out to anyone. Okay. Very good. So, we have time for about two questions. When you were saying about cleanliness and phone courtesy and all that stuff, what I do is I look at it, if something's going on, I try and go outside the box and think of myself as the customer, looking in and see if I would return to that business. Exactly. And, and I, you know, I worked right in the middle of that beauty salon, and I made sure that I was near the telephone. So I had one ear on my telephone that somebody was answering, and I had half of the other ear on the other hairdressers, and, you know, and then I'd talk to my customers, you know. but. You, you better be sure that the employees you have are treating you your well. customers the way you would. Questions? Comments? Another question? Thank you so much. Thank I you. appreciate it. Appreciate you, Kathy. Now, Robin has just a few points of information for you to wrap this up, and we'll get you out of here in just a couple of minutes. I have homework. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> Kitty gave you homework earlier to work on your pitches, and so I'm going to give you something too that is kind of fun. Um, everybody should have got a book, an enemy called Average. This is an awesome book. When I um, I had this book sitting on my shelf, and I went ahead. I thought this would be perfect for our entrepreneurs, and I went ahead and read it um, beforehand just so I could make sure. And it's really encouraging. It has a lot of great points in it. So I'd love for you guys to read it, and then next week, um, so you have a whole week to read it, and then next week we can discuss it a little bit. Um, the other thing, and if you didn't get a book, there it looks like there's two left, including this one. So if you didn't, um, we have more. Um, the other thing, today you guys got to do a one-minute pitch and slash introduction to your business. So. As Ernie was saying, where he works with the community business launches, um, a lot of those challenges are doing the pitches before, doing like a practice pitch before they actually have to do their pitch at the end of the competition. So we would like to do that. We have a lot of competitors, so we don't have as much time to give you the eight minute pitch that you would have in the end, but we are going to give you three minutes at the beginning of each class to do the pitch. So in order to do that, to make it fair, we're going to actually have you guys draw out of a bag so you can see um, which date you get. So it's going to be from sessions two to five, so starting next week. So um, I'll, before everybody leaves, I'll go around the room and get you to draw from this. Another 
thing that we're going to do, and the people from the 2013 Entrepreneur Challenge may remember this, but you guys did photos, and you were able to bring in um, some of your equipment or some kind of props. And so we really want to celebrate these businesses that are competing in this challenge. And so we want to take your picture, and we want to, um, we'll write a blog about you, and we'll put you on our website. There's actually some from the 2013 challenge on our website right now. So you can kind of get an idea. But we need to schedule these photo sessions with you before the class, so since we don't have time during the class. So we have them also um, scheduled from the second class to the fifth class. And starting at 5 o'clock, so I know that it's hard for some of you to get here, so we also have a schedule that when I have you draw out of the bag, we'll also go around and get you to schedule that. And one more thing. Um, so our third, fourth session on financial and legal, um, Carl has graciously let us do this. He will be instructing that class, but we want to build this class based on what you need as far as your financial and legal issues, questions, or concerns. So you'll notice in your folders that you have a piece of like a form that just says what keeps you up at night. So um, thinking of financial and legal issues, what keeps you up at night? So if you can just you know write some of those questions, comments, or anything on there. And you can email it to me in the meantime, or you can just bring it to the class um, next session. So that will be it. And thank you guys so much. This is, I know you've been receiving all kinds of emails from me lately, and it is great to see all of you here and to finally be able to meet you. So I look forward to